Welcome everyone. My name is Azim Badi. Uh, I am uh, uh, part of the uh, Department of Economics at Simon Fraser University. We have been um, fortunate enough to uh, have a number of our alumni come back and speak to us in, in different fields. And, uh, um, and today is no exception. Uh, today we'd like to uh, feature Dylan DePeace. Um, he is a uh, He's a grad um, from 2016 with a BA majoring in economics and minoring in labor studies. Dylan is currently a data analyst at the IRI Vancouver office. IRI is in, in its essence guides businesses to better leverage data to help them grow. Uh, I'm gonna let Dylan fill you in on the details, uh, but uh, Dylan is someone who is a welcome grad back who's in an area of work uh, that is growing and especially for our econ grads. Uh, for those of you who are not in econ, uh, definitely welcome you uh, as well. Uh, and I understand that there's people from all around the country joining us, so uh, welcome as well. So uh, I'm going to leave it to Dylan. Uh, welcome. Awesome. Thanks, Azim. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to start with how I got here, uh, here being talking today. Um, so I like to leverage LinkedIn quite a bit uh, as well. I've stayed in contact with Azim over the years since I graduated. and. For the past, uh, I guess, year, maybe two years, I've been posting regularly on LinkedIn, and that's led to me talking to a number of different people. Um, generally speaking, I don't know most of these people. It's just people reaching out, looking for advice. I'm always happy to help. But I started thinking, how can I kind of give back uh, and give back to people that have helped me out? So getting my degree from SFU in economics was massive for me. Um, I'd say that it's been one of the biggest things that I've done, and it's helped me in countless ways. So I reached out to Asim and basically just said, hey, like, what can I do to give back to the community? Um, and he said this. So I was able to um, schedule this for today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and yeah, like Asim said, any questions that you guys have, please feel free to ask as I go. Um, there's no need for this to be a presentation. I think I actually posted on LinkedIn a while ago that my favorite kind of presentations or the best kind are ones where there is a lot of back and forth. And it's more of a conversation than me just kind of preaching at you. Um, so yeah, any questions that you have, please feel free to interrupt. So with that, I'll just kind of go into my background a little bit. So as Asim said, I did my economics uh, degree at SFU. And since then, I've been a data analyst at IRI. So IRI is a company that basically just helps use data to work with consumer packaged goods, consumer packaged goods companies. So we work with everything from grocery stores to convenience stores. Um, in the US as well, we go as far as working with some drug stores and then as well on the other side. So there we work with suppliers. So all the biggest ones for your favorite soft drinks, uh, cereals, dairy, basically anything that you can find in any grocery store or convenience store, we've looked at some sort of data to deal with them. So my role itself has changed quite a bit over the years. Um, I first started off in planograms. And so planograms is a word that I didn't know before I started. Um, it basically just refers to the layout of products on a shelf. And so with that, we would use data and analytics, basically just seeing which items sold best, uh, what have you, and placing them on the shelf in a way that would optimize sales and also make it best for the customer. Um, because the other side of things is not just to make money, but also to make customers happy. So with that, um, I was able to kind of slowly move up, transferred over to more of the analytics side. Um, and now I work on a team of four people, um, just kind of doing, yeah, like data and analytics, all of that. So unless there's any questions, I'll continue on and start talking a little bit about things that I'm passionate about. Dylan, I'm wondering if I could just uh, ask uh... A quick question. I know that you've reached out on LinkedIn, LinkedIn to uh, a lot of super people, and obviously you and I have been in touch for the last number of years. But in terms of your getting this job, I know you're going to address it um, a uh, little later on. But uh, how did how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, this is a this is kind of an odd one. So I spent I guess it'd be seven months looking for a job out of university. Um, I spent my entire last semester, and then all of It'd be January, February, and most of March trying to find a job. Um, at the time, I was doing the old school submit a resume and cover letter, cross your fingers and hope. Um, and actually, this job came up through, it was a Facebook group 
that was for reselling textbooks. Um, and one of my siblings actually passed on the link and just said, hey, this has the word uh, analysis in it. That's the kind of job you want to do. So why don't you go ahead and apply? Um, it actually turned out that that was the job that I got. Um, I honestly wasn't sure what planograms were when I started. Fortunately, through the first interview, they explained the amount of data that they use and how it's very much a data-driven process. Um, and that kind of got me hooked. And yeah, just went from there. Um, had, fortunately at the time, it was just two interviews and then started, and I started in, it would be March of 2017, I guess. So I'm just coming up on four years now, almost there. Thanks very much. Awesome. So yeah, so continuing on that, uh, graduation in your first job. So a lot of what I've been talking to people about is trying to find your first job. Um, it's something that I struggled with a lot. Like I said, it took me seven months. Uh, I only had, I think, two or three actual interviews, on-site interviews before I got my job. So I mean, I applied to probably a couple of hundred before um, getting a job. So the one biggest thing that I've learned since then is really the power of LinkedIn. So when I graduated, I thought that LinkedIn was a place where you would just post your resume, someone would come reach out to you and you'd get a job. Um, I very much thought that that's what it was. And at the time it might've been a little bit more, but it's really changed a lot since then. Um, and the way that it's used now is fantastic. So it's a lot more of a place for back and forth. I say here, reaching out to people, there's, I think, a couple of people on here that have reached out to me or that I've reached out to, and we've kind of created friendships. Um, a lot of these happen just through much more natural conversation. Um, sometimes it is a very specific request looking for certain things. But that being said, there is a very specific way to reach out to people. If you kind of start off um, adding someone on LinkedIn and just say, you know, hi, there's a good chance that if you're reaching out to someone that has a fair number of connections, they might just kind of overlook that and just think, oh, they're just trying to be polite. If you're able to, with a connection request, basically say, hi, you know, my name's Dylan. Um, I'm just graduating SFU economics. I see that you also did economics at SFU. Um, I looked at your job. I think that it's really interesting. Here's one thing that I noticed about your company. Um, would love to connect. And so it can seem a bit like a cold pitch sometimes, um, and it can be, and that can kind of go either way. And so I think the biggest thing to do is just realize that you're talking to a human being, uh, as well as that people like to talk about themselves. I'm here to talk about myself for the next while, and it's just something that's kind of in our human nature. So really when you're reaching out, just yeah, make sure that you've got a good message um, and that you've done some research. So an example from a couple of months ago, I had someone reach out and they just said, you know, do you have half an hour to chat next week? Uh, they gave me a couple of time slots and asked for my phone number so they could basically handle calling me and all that I would have to do is answer. And these can go kind of one of two ways. If it's someone that isn't really sure what they want and they just say, you know, what's your day to day like? Tell me, you know, about your job. It can be hard to answer because you don't know what they're trying to get out of it. If you've got someone that's asking very specific questions like this person was, uh, and also that's very mindful of your time, you can get a great outcome. So I think I had, we'd agreed to a half an hour conversation at something like five o'clock on a Thursday. I got to about 525 and they said, you know, I've got a bunch more questions, but there's only five minutes left. I don't want to take up any more of your time. So I'm just going to ask the most important one. And because they were being so polite to me and they had kind of thought through questions, they had researched my background, all of those things. I think we ended up talking for a full hour just because I was happy to answer questions from someone that actually was willing to put in effort. Um, alongside that, with COVID being a thing right now, obviously, a lot more uh, conferences and conversations have turned virtual. And you're able to get into those much easier than expected. So two examples that I have where I've been part of conversations that I'm still amazed I was able to get in are one, it was a Vancouver uh, startup and it was, sorry, it was a Vancouver startup conference. And I was able to join and it was just like, it was a, a two hour cold pitch basically to a bunch of investors. And I just was able to join and watch live while they did that. Um, something that I can't imagine I would normally be able to join, but somehow they let me in. Uh, as well, you'll find that there's more and more happy hours popping up. Um, I join one personally, and of the 20 or 30 people that join every week, 
at least 10 of them are people that I would be amazed to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with. And yet they're there just answering questions from anyone that joins. You'll find that these people are often super nice and willing to help more than you'd ever expect, especially if you're willing to put in the effort uh, from your side. I'll pause for a second, just see if there's any questions kind of on you know, having conversations on LinkedIn, uh, reaching out in general, uh, anything like that. Again, you can put your questions in chat or uh, we can try and unmute you, um, but just let us know. Just a quick question about uh, LinkedIn, uh, Dylan, if you don't mind. Yep. What exactly is, I mean, you, you, you laid it out absolutely perfectly. Um, in fact, I'm going to be quoting you later on in, in the future for sure. Um, but is there a... Um, a protocol that you have that you use in terms of how many times you would touch base with someone um you know if you message someone what, what's that timeline in terms of when you expect them to respond back and if they don't do you just sort of leave it alone what's your take on that yeah definitely i think it's going to depend on the person um if it's someone that is clearly busy if they've got you know thousands of connections uh, it doesn't hurt to give it a week and then try again if it's someone that doesn't have as many, I mean, you can still do the same thing, but there's a better chance that either they're just not as active or maybe they're just not as open to it. And so I guess just kind of taking a bit of rejection and realizing that it's not necessarily rejection, they're not saying no, it might just be that they're not comfortable talking with you. Um, for myself personally, I haven't had too many issues with that, but I'm also very conservative with my approach. I prefer to try and find someone kind of similar to me where they're posting regularly uh, and get in through that way. So one thing that I had left out is I've had some very interesting conversations come up with people that are just liking and commenting on things that I post. So just to give everyone kind of an idea of what it looks like from the poster's view, I was checking a post that I had a couple of days ago and it had something like 500 views, which sounds like a lot, but it had something between 10 and 15 likes and maybe three or four comments. Um, so when you see those numbers, just putting likes on people's posts, first of all, is a bigger thing than you think. And people take notice, especially if you're someone that's getting, you know, between 10 and 20 likes on a post, you're very quickly gonna, you know, see a person's name two or three times and think, hmm, this person's paying attention to what I'm doing. They seem very kind. If they ever reached out to me, I'd be happy to respond. Um, even more with people that comment. So I've had a full friendship with someone just through LinkedIn based on him and I commenting on each other's posts. And for something like six months, that's all that we ever did until eventually one of us reached out and just had more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But those are ones where you know that the person's going to be happy to respond to you and that you've already kind of built up that relationship. Um, so with that being said, it is kind of a slower thing. If you try to rush it, it can often come across as kind of abrasive and like you're trying to just take. Um, whereas this a lot of the time can be a two-way street. Um, one other example is just a person that reached out to me uh, probably six months ago just asking for a bit of advice. And they did it in a very kind way. They had researched my background a bit and had specific questions. And then actually a week or two ago, I was working on my own personal project and I had seen that they had posted something uh, prior to that, looking at something similar. And so when I hit a snag, I reached out to them and just said, hey, have you ever seen this error before? And now the person and I are working through it together, um, hopefully able to get to a resolution, but you've got someone that you can bounce things off of. I think one of the biggest things, especially if you're a student, is that you probably have a lot more to give than you think. Um, and even just posting about what you're working on in school. And obviously, to some extent, you can't post everything. But I can remember back when I did a project, I was in MATLAB, I think, which I haven't touched since. But it was just some sort of forecasting that we did. And now that I think back on it, that was super interesting and cool. And even just posting you know, a little bit about it and asking questions to the community. Um, the data community in general is very good at replying and just very kind. So having anything like that, you're gonna get a lot of helpful replies. And as long as you're not being opinionated, which I'm sure no one will be, um, you'll get good, good responses and kind of be able to create friendships and connections that way. Thank you. Awesome. Is there any more questions in the chat or should I continue on? Yeah, I think we can keep going. Perfect. Um, next, using the power of a university email. 
So this kind of goes with the email and also just being a student in general. People can remember being in your place. I remember the months of trying to find a job and just being so confused and just wanting some sort of help from anyone. Um, and so now whenever I see anyone reach out with a school email or just, um, I guess, being in school through LinkedIn, it doesn't matter even if they're not from my school, uh, even not from my country. You can remember yourself in those in that place and a lot more people will be willing to respond to you. Whereas once you have a job, it can be a lot harder to get people to talk with you. Um, and people will be probably a little bit less lenient because they see that you're in the real world now and you've got your first job. So I think really utilizing the fact that you're a student or a recent graduate that can still say you're a student, um, that's a bigger thing than you realize and that power goes away quite quickly. Um, lastly here, resources while at school. So this is something that I personally really regret is not spending more time talking with um, ASM specifically and also my professors. So touching on ASM, I had an exit interview when I left SFU, uh, when I graduated, I guess. And in that one hour conversation, I think I learned more than the previous six months of Googling, um, researching everything on my own. So specifically with an econ advisor, this person's gonna know what you've done with school and understand the paths that so many other people have taken. So just while having a conversation, I quickly figured out that the type of job that I wanted wasn't a job in government. I figured out as well that I didn't want a job in finance. And I started to narrow things down a little bit just in that one hour conversation. That being said, the conversation wasn't all just about me. Part of it was about talking about the program, but that conversation was one that if I had had earlier, I would have had better direction. I think I would have probably found a job that I liked uh, even sooner. As well, professors can be a great resource, and that's something that I very much regret, is the lack of going to office hours. I know in some of my fourth year classes, I had um, quite a small group of people, 20 or 30, and I'm sure that office hours, they would have been happy to have us attend, and I never really did, until right at the end when I would talk to them um, and was just asking for references in case I wanted to do a master's. And I found out more information about what they had gone through and again, they really understand what you've learned and that can really help you with your journey. Um, one thing that I wish I had known way back was that linear regression and machine learning are basically the same thing. And that was something that I thought was super interesting, but also thought that I needed a PhD to do. Um, and now I study it on my own and have very much been able to make strides with it. Um, Dylan, if you don't mind, uh, there's a question from, uh, from a student. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, bit more about how you knew that you were interested in data analysis jobs? Also, are there any specific courses that helped you in your journey? And I'm yeah. sure you're going to get that to, the, to that later, but this is a good, good question. Definitely. Yeah, I'll start with courses. So I took two courses that helped a lot. Um, one of them, I can't remember the number, but it was an advanced macro course where we basically went through two uh, papers every week and just kind of dissected them and looked at them. And that was where I first came across linear regression and really just like data decision, uh, data driven decision making. And just seeing how powerful that was as opposed to just opinion was fantastic for me and really made me be a lot more sure that I wanted something where I was able to use numbers alongside logic instead of just logic. Uh, as well, I took another class and it was just on game theory. Um, so there we got to do our own experiments. My experiment was, oh, I can't remember exactly what we had decided to do. It was something around, um, I'm fully blanking on it. I know that the experiment ended up with being, you get $10 and you distribute it between yourself and another person. And basically if you can agree on the amount, then you both get it. So I say, I'll take $6 and you take $4 you agree we walk away. If I say you get $1 and I get nine and you say, no, we both get nothing. Uh, so both of those classes were extremely helpful for me and were able to kind of guide more what I wanted um, as well as seeing classes that I didn't necessarily want to do. So remember an international finance class that I took where we were looking at uh, interest rates and exchange rates and everything. And I thought, like I really enjoyed the class and thought it was interesting but I could never see myself in a position doing something like that. Hopefully that answers the question. 
Uh, so the just the first part of that question was, um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you knew you're interested in data? And was that maybe that's the, the answer to that question as well? Yeah, um, I think just really the excitement that I started feeling when I saw um, kind of just papers using data driven decision making. Um, really just seeing that you could take numbers that seemed all jumbled sometimes, you know, thousands or millions of rows of data and turning that into something that has a story attached to it at the end. That was what really got me excited for it. And that's when I became a lot more sure of it. Um, I think just kind of looking at the classes that you're taking and trying to talk to someone that has experience in certain fields would be the best way of doing it. Um, part of how I knew as well was talking with Asim and saying, you know, which are the classes that I like the most? And him saying, okay, well, that sounds like this, or it doesn't sound like that. Um, that was kind of really how I figured it out. And even then, I wasn't 100% sure until I started actually working in the field. So I'm going to uh, just guess those classes because I just I just pulled up your transcript there, Dylan, just to let you know. <laughs> I can tell you the professors <laughs> if that helps. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, yeah, I think four, uh, I think 480. Three was, yeah. Tell me the professors. Was, uh, so it would have been, I think, I want to say four twenty eight with Luba Peterson. That's correct. And yep. yeah, four eighty three with Yasmina. Yep, that's uh, the computational. Yeah, probably. So those yeah. two, I would highly recommend if they're still offered. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're both still here. So uh, whatever courses there, they do teach. For those of you who are in econ, um, uh, they're going to teach these type of related courses. Uh, Luba is a, a macro specialist, so definitely. Yeah, and she got me very excited about um, reading papers and being able to see what the actual impact was on the real world. I think up until I took that class, I viewed reading papers as just kind of another academic pursuit. And by the end of that class, I saw kind of what the point of people actually writing papers was and doing research was. Perfect. Uh, another quite quick question here, um, Dylan. Uh, to add uh, to that, skills we can learn or begin to on our own or for interested data analyst jobs. Definitely, yeah. Um, it's going to kind of depend on what you want, but there's a couple of things that are going to be the same no matter what. Um, in terms of hard skills, I would definitely say learn SQL, uh, sometimes pronounced SQL, uh, and Excel. So those two things are the basis for absolutely everything. SQL, you're going to always be having to pull data from somewhere. For the most part, it's going to be a database. As well, just understanding how data can be organized and learning things like a primary key and table joins. And if those things are all confusing to you right now, then I would suggest just trying to find any course on SQL and learning it. Uh, as well, with Excel, you always want to use the coolest tools, but the business oftentimes isn't going to let you simply because they need to understand what you're doing. So a lot of what I deliver ends up being in Excel format because the business can manipulate it and look at it and they understand the tool. But you can even use advanced Excel knowledge to learn how to do things like programming. When I first started learning how to use Python, I found out that there was a library called Pandas that had been, uh, I think the quote was, it's Python's version of Excel. And I could see very quickly how two different things would be done, or sorry, the same thing would be done um, in Excel versus in Python. And as soon as you can see those two things and you can replicate across, you're going to learn a lot quicker. So really in terms of hard skills, it's going to be those two. Uh, soft skills, it's unfortunately the usual presentation, um, learning how to talk uh, and storytelling are kind of the biggest ones. So we're, we're going to move on a little bit here, uh, Dylan, but just uh, some quick uh, notes uh, here. Uh, one is uh, from Lubaba. Uh, Yes, uh, Luba still teaches. Uh, we just have to look at the next course offerings. I'm not sure if she's teaching in the summer, uh, but we can look at that a little later on. Uh, Tofik is asking what you actually do, and I think you have that on your next slides anyways, but um, you would love to have an example of, of, of what you do. So um, that's a good question. So I'm not sure if you want to do that now or maybe move on. Yeah, perfect. So I'll kind of cover what I do as I go through this slide. Um, so yeah, so my actual work as a data analyst. So when people ask what your day-to-day -day is like as a data analyst, there's so many different answers that you get because there's so many different types of analysts. 
um, as well, the word data analyst means different things to different people. I've seen everything from business analysts that are called data analysts, uh, data scientists that are called data analysts, data engineers, uh, ETL developers. There's so many different things that can be called a data analyst. So what my kind of data, anal data analyst is, is pretty similar to a business analyst, but with a bit more technical knowledge. Um, so I'll kind of go through some of the main things. And one of the biggest things that I work on uh, is projects and ad hoc requests. Um, as well, I do a fair bit of development work, but that's less data analyst work um, and more backend. Um, and honestly, won't make a lot of sense unless someone's specifically seen the software that I'm working with. So I'll talk through kind of what a normal project lifestyle life cycle looks like. So the very first thing is just working with stakeholders to define the question. So oftentimes um, someone will come up to us and say, hey, I have this question that I wanna answer. And oftentimes what they ask is not what they're actually trying to do. So someone will say, I want to find out, you know, how many dollars this one item sold or this one category. And if you just come back to them with that number, they're gonna go, oh, okay. And that'll kind of be the end of it. Whereas if you can kind of dig in more and figure out what they're looking for and why they're trying to find that out, you're gonna be able to provide a lot more value. So one of the things that we do is if we receive a quick email saying, hey, I'm looking for this one thing, we try to set up a quick meeting to have a larger discussion and figure out why it is that they're trying to uh, get an answer to their question. And oftentimes this means that we're gonna pull something very different than they think, because from a business perspective, they're trying to answer one question um, from our perspective as data analysts, we're gonna answer it in a different way that still gives them the correct answer, but can maybe give them more peripheral around um, why a certain thing is in a certain way. So really spending the time with the business up front is gonna save a lot of time later on. Um, when I first started receiving requests myself, um, ones that didn't necessarily go through a manager, but came directly to me, I would hop on them, be super excited, uh, deliver it and then have the person at the end go, oh, this isn't really what I was looking for. It's exactly what they had asked, but what they had asked for wasn't what they meant. So spending more time to really figure out what it is that they're looking for is going to be a big thing. Next, uh, gathering your data to analyze. So this is going back to what I said about SQL. You're pretty much always going to have to pull your own data. Um, depending on the kind of company that you work for, that might mean that you're going into your own SQL database, um, pulling it yourself and analyzing later. Um, for me right now, we have some fantastic software that kind of helps with that part and speeds it up. And very rarely are you going to be handed data. I can remember probably two or three times total where I was sent an Excel spreadsheet and asked to do some work on it. And that's extremely rare. Um, so really figuring out what data to pull as well um, and spending more time on that. So there's been quite a few times where I've started work, um, gathered all my data, jumped to the next step of doing the analysis, get a couple of days in even, and then realize, oh, I missed one type of metric that I'm looking for, or I missed something that I should have included in there. And then you have to restart the whole thing. So really spending the extra time up front ends up saving a lot more time in the long run. As well, doing the analysis. So figuring out what the output should look like. So this goes back to that first question of what are they really trying to answer? And really, who is this going to? If it's someone that's really good with numbers, sometimes I'll be handing off just an Excel sheet and saying, hey, here's the main insights from it in a summary email, but manipulate it as you see, and we can chat more about it later. Other times it'll be to someone higher up in the business that doesn't have as much time. And we'll spend sometimes days just going through and trying to really refine and make a good presentation just so that we can really show them what we want. And so that's really gonna depend on who you're presenting to as well as how much time you have. And lastly, presenting while being an introvert. So it probably doesn't seem like it, but I'm quite introverted. Um, introvert here, I'm gonna define as someone who requires a lot of energy to speak, um, especially to people that they don't necessarily know. And so when I first came into my job, I was known as being very quiet. Um, I was fortunate. I was placed uh, at a desk kind of in a corner. I was able to avoid talking for the most part at the beginning, uh, and this suited me well. But as I moved on and needed to present more, I kind of had to get past that presentation part. Um, first of all, you're always going to be nervous, uh, 
even before today, I was most definitely nervous. Um, any new scenario or environment is going to make you nervous, but as you see the same environment over and over, it can be easier. Um, presenting on screen like this can be a little bit easier because it's familiar. You're looking at the same screen. Uh, in person, if you're in the same room all the time, it can be easy. New rooms can sometimes be scary. Uh, but as well, working with a manager to really figure out how to become more comfortable with presentations. So when I first started off, I would do all the top three steps. I'd have my analysis done. And then instead of me going and presenting it live, I would present it to my manager. Uh, fortunately, she would give me very good feedback. And then her and I would go together and she would present it live. And I would sit there and listen. And if I needed to add in details here or there, I would. So that really taught me how to see other people presenting and where I could improve. And then as time went on, I was able to do presentations to slightly larger groups or one-on-one -on -one with my manager backing me up instead of the other way around, me backing her up. And so really just doing a kind of a slow build can be extremely helpful if you're nervous, which most people probably will be. Um, and then just really spending the time to be prepared. So one of the massive advantages of being an introvert is that that nervousness is going to mean that you're going to end up being more prepared. Uh, for example, with this, I read through slides many times, had talking points as I went, and just spent a bunch more time on this than I would have if I wasn't as introverted. Um, and that can come out as a positive for the most part. So yeah, a really large part of what I do is kind of working with this project life cycle. Um, I'd like to point out as well that with the project life cycle, it isn't always an analysis that's being done. Sometimes a project life cycle can be scoping out new development work. Um, we work kind of a bit with people that are similar to software developers. And so we'll spend some time working through things with them and making sure that they understand what we're trying to get out of it as kind of the end. So here would be almost like the analysis, except that they're building a new tool. Uh, lastly, ad hoc requests and what happens when people see value. So with being a data analyst, a lot of people aren't going to understand what you do and how you provide value until you really start showing them. And at times that can end up opening the floodgates to requests. So we've had it in the past where things have been slow for a couple of weeks or even a month or two. And then we'll do some analysis that gets shown to one person, it gets passed around the building. And the next thing we know, we've got 10 emails in our inbox asking for us to do all sorts of things. So the way you can really tell when you're doing a good job is when a bunch more requests come in. The one problem there is you now have a bunch more requests that you need to work through. And so prioritizing different tasks and kind of who they're going to go to can be super, super hard to do and require a lot of communication between you and the rest of the team. Are there any questions before I continue on? Just, just a comment uh, from Lubav, uh, who uh, just said, uh, as an introvert myself, thanks for mentioning this. It's great to see people talking about how they, they're working as an introvert. So um, I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> you did a great job. Um, uh, and thanks for that comment. Um, I do have a couple of questions um, because that's a lot of stuff in this, in this project life, life cycle. I'm gonna, some practical questions for you, Dylan. One is uh, deadlines. Um, uh, uh, are there, there are there strict deadlines? What kind of pressure are you uh, put under? Are they flexible? What's what's that like? Yeah, so deadlines are a tricky thing with the business. Um, it's going to depend a lot on what the request is and who it's going to. If it's someone that I'm comfortable with, sometimes deadlines can be a little bit more flexible than you think. That being said, you want to meet deadlines obviously as often as you can, um, and that goes back to knowing that first question of what are they using it for. If it's something that's for a meeting on Friday, then you wanna make sure that it's done by then. And that can go back to just asking a couple of extra questions. Uh, as well, um, I guess prioritizing tasks can become a big thing. And that again, goes back to communication. So nobody wants you to kind of show up on the day that something's due and say, oh, I need a couple more days. You generally know in advance if you're gonna be late on something. And the more that you can communicate that, the better. Um, that being said, every once in a while, things are late for one reason or another. I've had it before where, you know, a database has gone down, uh, you can't pull your data, somehow you lost a file, whatever else, or even just a sick day. So again, just being open and just saying, you know, I'm sorry, I said I'd have it to you on this date. Here's the things that happened. Um, basically, I'll try to get it to you as quickly as I can. Um, it's kind of 
the best way that I've found to deal with it. And just realizing that at times you're not gonna be able to make everyone happy, but it's also not the end of the world. You're gonna slip up every once in a while. And when that happens, you need to just kind of take a couple minutes, figure out what went wrong, figure out what you can do better and try to not have the same mistake again. I found as long as you learn from when you're making a mistake, you're gonna end up being fine in the long run. Thanks, Dylan. Dylan, if you can give us an example without, you know, it being so long about how you've gone through each step. So, you know, I, I, I often hear this from many of our speakers is, um, uh, you know, one thing that econ has helped you with is helping to define or ask a question or help people uh, ask the right question. So maybe from there, you can give us an example of, 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 of a project that you've worked on. Definitely, yeah. Um, I'm going to talk in pretty vague terms just because I kind of have to. Um, yeah, definitely just starting to dig into really the why. Um, so one thing that I've been taught that I found super helpful is just asking kind of, so what, which is just another form of saying, you know, why do you need this? And if you ask that enough, you're going to eventually get to an answer of why they really need it. Um, as well with econ specifically, it starts to help you think about all of the other things that could be influencing something. So while we often say that numbers don't lie because a number is a number, you can manipulate that to say whatever you want. Econ really helps to figure out, okay, what are the other peripheral things here that could be influencing it? Um, for example, with COVID, you probably saw that certain items were harder to buy, so that could influence sales. So taking into account things like that, uh, that's really where econ is gonna help quite a bit. Um, and helping to define that question um, and really ask why and so what after you've asked more of the questions. Is there any particular, um, you know, area or, or sources that you use to, to, to get data? Like where, where, where are you deriving your data from? Uh, yeah, so work? ours comes directly from our clients. Um, it gets clean through a number of different people and tools. And then ours gets uh, spit out through our own proprietary data source, um, which like I said, won't make a lot of sense if I say it. Um, if anyone's seen you know, Tableau or Power BI before, our software looks kind of similar to that. So that's how we get our data now. Um, we still have access to some SQL tables, things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on what you're trying to grab um, for where you're gonna get the data from. For most people in most jobs, you are just gonna be going and pulling data out of um, a warehouse yourself or a database, sorry. And my last question, Dylan, you had mentioned uh, the power of Excel. And I, I guess I can't emphasize that enough uh, that, that um, you know, everyone here who's doing econ or related stuff, um, you know, you learn R or or Python or uh, SQL or MATLAB, you know, the general public is still, you know, using Excel. And so um, uh, the power of Excel uh, can't be underestimated. But specifically R, are you using R in any of your applications? No, so in we statistics? fully <clears throat> are just using Excel um, for the simple reason that the business needs to be able to understand what we're doing. And I think that's one of the things that we sometimes brush over in school is that when you finish something, you need to really be able to prove what you've done. Um, I know we have to show our work in things like math. It can be very similar when you're talking to a business, especially if you're giving them numbers that contradict what they're expecting. So oftentimes, and this kind of goes back to that first question, they're going to have an idea or a feeling about something, and you're going to either be trying to prove them right or prove them wrong. When you prove them right, it's simple. They're going to be thankful. They're going to be happy. When you prove them wrong, there can be times where a conversation has to be had and you need to be able to show what you've done. And Excel can be a great way to do that because it's very likely that even if they haven't spent a lot of time in Excel, they're going to understand what it is that you've done. Uh, as well, with Excel, you'd be amazed the amount of things that you can actually figure out in there. Um, you can make things look like it's not Excel. We've delivered a bunch of different things that um, have been everything from dashboards and scorecards to ad hoc analysis, even sometimes finished projects or templated uh, reports for them to just fill in their own data that look nothing like Excel. And people are actually surprised when they realize that it is Excel. Um, I've been very fortunate and 
my coworkers are very advanced Excel users. Um, they've taught me an absurd amount and that's honestly really been very helpful. And with Excel, you can do pretty much anything that you can do in, um, I guess pretty not, not everything, but you can do a lot of what you can do in Python. Uh, sometimes it won't be as efficient um, and there can be better ways of doing things in different programming languages, but you really do need to make sure that the business is able to um, read what you've done and understand what you've done so that they're gonna actually use it. So I'm just being aware of, of time because it's 10 after one already, we're flying through here. Uh, we do have another quick question here in terms of, um, and I think it's a good question. Do you recommend any resources to help us learn how to do advanced stuff in Excel? And it's the, by the stuff, could you also define what other stuff in Excel would be in your, from your perspective, Dylan? Would it be, you know, learning macros? Would it be pivot tables? Um, you, you, you tell us and, and where we yeah. could get those resources. Those are both very good places to start. Uh, macros, I know, can be a bit scary. Um, so starting with very basic ones can be helpful. And that is a good way to kind of slowly segue into doing more programming. Uh, pivot tables are extremely powerful. Um, as well, just kind of learning the different ways that you can show data. So one of the biggest things that I learned is that you can turn off grid lines and you can then highlight your own little blocks of output to make it look a lot prettier. You don't have to just show this giant grid. You can have it look almost like it's PowerPoint um, and just showing three or four big numbers that you want to, to kind of display there. Um, sorry, what was the other part of the question, Asim? The, the resources uh, that uh, you, know, you can tap to learn more Excel online. The resources. Um, I guess, yeah, for learning, just try to find someone that you trust. Uh, and it doesn't have to be someone personally. So I know for myself, there's a number of podcasts that I listen to, for example. And if I see that they've released a course on Excel, then I already trust what they're saying. I've kind of vetted it myself. Um, and I know that it's gonna be a good resource. If you are looking for something to get started in Excel, feel free to reach out to me on, on LinkedIn. I've seen a couple of people that I've interacted with a bit that seem to have very good um, resources to go through. Some of them paid, some of them free. Uh, lastly, YouTube the number of views and likes on a video is going to be a very good indicator of whether something's good or not. The only hard part can sometimes be finding if something's too basic or too advanced for you. One thing I want to add is if you're a current SFU student, you have access to uh, LinkedIn Learning actually, which used to be lynda.com and I'm sure there's lots of helpful tutorials on Excel there. That's so a good point. Yeah. Um, when I first started, I used Linda a fair bit because I still had my subscription. I think it was still active for a little while after I graduated. Um, and I went through a bunch of different Linda courses and found them, yeah, very good. Um, there's even a couple of people that I've come across on LinkedIn that are those people that I trust that have done their own LinkedIn learning courses. Um, so you are going to get good resources there for sure. So Carmen has just uh, posted everyone uh, the, the LinkedIn learning. Uh, Anything else or should I continue on? I think you should continue on. Um, uh, just one more last note from Aaron here. Talk, talk myself as well from my current job when LinkedIn learning. Uh, sorry, Asim, I think you're talking, but I can't really hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, just uh, there's been a post from Carmen about LinkedIn learning. Can you hear me? Yeah, you gotta up your volume, um, Asim, because you you sound you sound like you're really far away. Uh, there's another question here from Yashat. He's um, they say, can projects on Kaggle be an, an advantage in resume? I'm not sure what Kaggle is, but you might know, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll actually hop to the next one for this. So projects are very important and very helpful for finding jobs and Kaggle's a fantastic place to start. Um, I think one of the biggest things is really kind of showing people what you know, as opposed to telling. So your resume is gonna say certain things and interview is gonna say certain things. I personally, being an introvert, I'm not great at promoting myself when I'm talking to someone directly, but I can talk about a project that I've done for days. So really, if you're finding uh, some interesting data sets on Kaggle, spend the time to really learn them, um, do some interesting things, and then talk about it. Talking about it can take all different forms. It could be you know, a post on LinkedIn or a bunch of posts there. Um, you could write an article, again, LinkedIn or using Medium. I'm just kind of having it out there so that you can reference it later. And then even being able to show that in uh, job interviews. So if they ask you a question about a certain technology or whatever else, or you know, have you ever come across a data set like this? 
you're then able to say, yeah, I was doing this project on my own time, um, which shows a lot of passion. And you can give a very good answer instead of talking about something hypothetical. Anything else? No, I think you can move on. Can you guys well, you're still super quiet, as oh, okay. Yeah, uh, sure, I did. I think you can um, go on uh, talking about this slide while well, Azam try to figure figure out his uh, my problems. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so uh, personal development, aka learning, never stops. So I was super excited when I finished my degree because it meant that I was able to then pick exactly what I wanted to learn. Obviously, within your degree, you can still pick courses, but sometimes parts of the courses are going to be things that you honestly don't really care that much about. So when you exit school, you can continue on. Uh, your formal education ends up being a fantastic base to build on. So for myself, learning things like machine learning, um, that was very helpful to build upon all of the math skills that I had. Um, seeing things like linear regression and everything made it a lot easier to understand what I was going and then learning on my own. Um, so really having that school background is very, very good, um, but it doesn't mean that you have to stop there. And so as well, economics really teaches us how to think. Um, and the second thing that you have to learn, and hopefully you've done at least a bit throughout university is learning how to learn better. Um, so really figuring out what your learning style is. So for me personally, I can't learn very well over videos, but I'm fantastic when I'm reading something or working on my own projects. And those are the things where I get completely lost in time. And the next thing I know, I've spent three or four hours working on something and I've learned a lot. So hands-on is very easily one of the most important things for me. Um, so yeah, really just combining those two things and looking for outside resources. Um, one of the other things is that when you first get into whatever job you're in, a bunch of new skills are gonna pop up that you've probably never thought about before. So little things like how exactly do I write an email depending on who the audience is for? Um, even funnier, when do I reply all versus just hitting reply? And then just kind of office politics as well and really learning how to conduct yourself in a meeting. All of those things you're gonna learn very quickly once you get out of school. And so continuing to be in learning mode is a very good way to kind of get yourself ahead. Um, for myself, I spent the first six months in one department, learned as much as I could, and then kind of slowly transferred out of there and had to learn a bunch again. And then another year and a half later, new technology came in that I, again, had to learn. Being in a learning mindset that whole time helped me immensely. And I was able to go a lot faster than some other people that weren't as ready to be learning because they had kind of slowed down on their learning. Um, that being said, it can be tiring. And my bottom point here of taking the time to learn things that formal education doesn't teach you becomes quite important. Uh, for myself, this has taken yeah, the form of machine learning, but also things to kind of help with myself uh, mentally. So I was doing yoga a bit before, that's kind of slowly drifted off, um, but that's been taken over by mindfulness and meditation. So one of the biggest things that I didn't do in school was learn how to manage stress. Um, pretty much every time finals would come around for two weeks, I would get so stressed out that my jaw would lock up. Um, I remember distinctly one time trying to eat a sandwich from Quiznos and I couldn't open my mouth enough to eat it, so I just didn't. Whereas now I've kind of learned, okay, you're getting stressed, take a step back. What are the things that you can do to help with that stress? Um, so like I said, meditation has been a big one for me. Um, I always thought that meditation was going to be something that Kind of hippies did for lack of a better word um, but it's really more about learning to control yourself and kind of sense your feelings more i very quickly within about five minutes of just sitting and concentrating on breathing can tell if i'm stressed and for the most part what's stressing me um, as well just exercising regularly especially right now with covid sometimes we're stuck inside for a while i forget to go outside i'll be cranky and then either someone will suggest to me to go outside or i'll thankfully remember that I should go outside and even just a 20 minute walk completely changes that and reduces my stress. Um, so really just taking the time to, as you're finishing up school, learn some of the things that university hasn't taught you because it can't cover everything. Um, using things like books and podcasts has been my go-to, but I'm sure there's a bunch of other things out there that you'd be able to use for resources.
Any other questions? I'm just going to test out. Can you guys hear my audio now? Oh, good. <laughs> I have to change headsets. Um, so we have about um, nine minutes left. Actually, it's 121. Um, please, uh, we're opening this up to questions if you guys have any. I mean, I, I can ask questions all day, but please, we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, any favorite books and podcasts you'd recommend? Definitely, yeah. So I'll start with podcasts because that's something that I do every single day. Um, for work, uh, Manager Tools, which also does another one called Career Tools. So it really just teaches you basically how to conduct yourself in the workplace. Um, and especially with COVID, that's been extremely helpful because they have a lot of advice on remote work. Uh, for data science, I spent a lot of time listening to the Super Data Science podcast. Um, I found that the peripheral knowledge there was great. It taught me a lot of terms and techniques that I was confused about and didn't really go into the math behind it, um, which is good because then I was able to get both sides of it. Um, and then for my own enjoyment, Freakonomics, uh, the whole suite of Freakonomics. So they also have uh, No Stupid Questions and People I Mostly Admire. Those are easily three of my favorite podcasts. Um, and that was what actually got me a little bit into economics. Uh, in terms of books, I read a couple of very good ones. Uh, if you're an introvert or you have any friends that are introverts, so pretty much everyone, a book called Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking was amazing for me. It changed my worldview of myself. Um, as well, Factfulness by Hans Rosling. I read that earlier this year. Anyone that's in economics, you're going to love that book, and it's very helpful. Uh, and then lastly, Atomic Habits, which just really taught me how to build a lot of the things that I do on a regular basis, including reading and listening to podcasts, into habits. Um, it's working the same with me, uh, same for meditation and turning things from something that you have to do to something that you actually end up craving. So this would be kind of my main recommendations. We have one that I, I missed from Tofik. Uh, are there internships through the academic curriculum? So maybe for a general, more broader question there is, are there internships available uh, that you know of either at your company or other data, data science companies that you know of? And um, are there recommending companies? Are there any companies that you would recommend? Yeah, unfortunately, we're actually still kind of getting started in Canada. My company is very US based. Um, so being quite small, we don't have that at the moment. I'm sure one day we will. Um, unfortunately, I haven't actually seen many others in Canada, but that's also not something that I'm super attuned to, unfortunately. Um, so don't really have much more information on that. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, what specific data science skills that employers uh, would want uh, from you? What are the specific skills that you think that graduates would want uh, from recent graduates? Yeah, I think it's going to depend on the type of job you're looking for. If you're looking for a data analyst, SQL is by far the most important thing. Um, the trifecta is kind of SQL, Python, and Tableau or Power BI. So SQL to pull your data, uh, Python to analyze it, although here you could swap out Excel, and I would definitely suggest that if you don't have a coding background. Um, and then Tableau or Power BI to show your data. Again, you can do this with Excel and you can make it look really nice. It just takes a bit more effort. Um, and then I think there was a second part of that question. Um, no, just, uh, no, I think you answered that. Um, we have a question here. How important do you think CGPA would be for recent grads? That's a good question. I'm not sure what that refers to. Oh, your grade point average. Oh, okay. Um, it's going to depend. If you're looking at, I'll rephrase this. I would look at who is in the companies that you're looking for. If you're trying to go work somewhere where it seems that a lot of people have their, um, their grade point put on you know, their LinkedIn, um, if it seems like a lot of competition is there, it could be used to weed out. If you're looking at something like a startup where you've got a lot more people that maybe just do a bachelor's and they don't go past to a master's or a PhD, it's probably not going to matter much. Uh, for me personally, I've been part of the hiring process a little bit and I completely ignore GPA. Um, a little bit of an aside, I had an extremely low GPA more than once uh, below a two. I ended up graduating with an okay one, but it's honestly not a very good indicator of how you'll do in the real world. Um, you can put it there. I would prefer to put probably more like if you had any honors or anything like that, but even still um, for, I'd say most companies, especially something like a startup or a smaller company, they're not really going to look at it. 
That's a great point, Dylan. Um, this is a good question. What personal projects are you working on right now and how do you choose them? Awesome, yeah. Um, so the last one that I did was looking at COVID data. So just the rates of infection and comparing that with uh, Google's mobility reporting. Um, that was really one because I just wanted to get more into Tableau. Um, I hadn't really used it much. So it gave me a good chance to do visualization. Um, from there, it's yeah, trying to decide what you'd find interesting and where you can get data. So at the moment, I'm currently trying to web scrape for the first time, which has been all sorts of interesting. Um, different realty data. So I wanted to see um, basically a, a new version of a project that I had done back when I was first learning, which is just that you can use linear regression to predict house prices. Um, specifically in the Vancouver or greater Vancouver area, I'm trying to kind of do two things. One, my own uh, unsupervised clustering to see if things line up the way that I'd expect. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of knowledge of housing around here um, and then as well, seeing if it is just the normal things like square footage, um, bedrooms and baths, if um, that's the main influence on price. Really, the point of this project is one, to learn how to web scrape. Um, uh, and aside on web scraping, spend a lot of time looking up the do's and don'ts of it. You definitely don't wanna crash someone's website. You need to be respectful of rules, all of that. Um, if you can find someone that has scraped before to help guide you, I would highly recommend that. And then as well, it's going to give me very dirty data that I have to clean myself. And that's something that I've been wanting to spend more time doing is just cleaning data that looks honestly pretty terrible. Um, I've looked at my output so far and it's almost hard to read. So it'll be an interesting thing, uh, learning how to clean it and kind of finding all the exceptions and everything. That's the, I guess the last project that I worked on and yeah, the current one that I'm working on now. Um, and I am posting semi-regularly about the one that I'm on at the moment. I'm very, very conscious of our time here, uh, Dylan, uh, but one quick question, last question here is, do you think it's useful to put scholarships on resumes? Uh, again, it's going to depend on the kind of job that you're applying to. If it's one where it seems like they're going to have a lot of, um, I guess, high academic achieving people in there, then definitely. Um, otherwise, might not be super helpful. If you have the room and you don't have much else to put on there, then it could be worth it. Um, it's going to depend, I guess, yeah, on both the company and what else you have on there. If it kind of lends to your story about who you are, which is part of what a resume should be, is kind of explaining your background, um, then it can be helpful. But I'd definitely be paying a lot of attention to the company that you're sending it to. Um, and again, just spending a bit of time researching through LinkedIn if the people on there seem to be the type that would have um, high academics. So even just seeing if you've got a lot of master's and PhDs in the company. So everyone, that being said, um, you know, I'm wondering if Dylan could stick around for a few more minutes, but it's almost 1.30. Just a, a quick note is, is there a way that uh, uh, people can, uh, or do you mind people uh, uh, connecting with you on LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely how... feel free to reach out. The greatest thing is if you send just a quick message saying why you're connecting. Um, I get a lot of requests. I accept most of them, um, but if you send that note, then I'll probably remember your name. Um, and it can just kind of make a better relationship um, as well. Time wise, I'm good until two. So I can definitely stick around. Oh, perfect. More. More. Excellent. So yeah, just a quick hint, uh, mentioning to Dylan that you were part of this, uh, this uh, event would be, would be very useful. Um, Dylan, in terms of um, your uh, sort of state of mind after you just graduated, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people are feeling anxious these days about COVID, what the opportunities are like. I mean, you have shown us, or, you know, you've come, you, you now are equipped with lots of skills and, and, and you know, uh, you know, experience. A lot, of our, a lot of our students don't have that. Um, are employers aware that students don't have much they feel they can offer in terms of yeah. skill sets? Honestly, it's, it's hard. It's very hard as a student. So, I mean, I was applying to jobs that were much below what I ended up getting in terms of requirements, just because you can feel beat down. Um, I honestly think the biggest things to do are to really find a way to showcase what you do know, because it can be hard to tell. Um, I tell, I mean, like literally tell them what you know. 
Uh, it's much harder to say, you know, I have these skills versus again, just showing. And that's where it goes back to projects or a portfolio. Um, honestly, some of the things that you do in university are more advanced than I do now. And if I had kept track of those and I had, you know, gone that one extra step after handing in the project to my professor and just kind of done a little write up on it, um, that would be huge. And making sure that kind of gets into the hands of employers um, as well. If you can find a way to reach out to someone within a company that you're wanting to apply to, instead of just going directly through um, whatever it is, Indeed or their personal websites, you basically go from being one of two or 300 people, because that's about the average number of resumes I'm seeing when you post a job to someone that's probably going to get immediate attention. Um, and again, especially if you have some stuff that shows that one, you've got the skills, which I know can be very hard. Um, and two, that you're willing to put in the extra effort. Those are really the big things. Um, so kind of going back to it. Yes, employers are often aware that your skills aren't always insane, um, and that you haven't done years and years of things. Um, again, it's it's just hard because there's so many applicants to jobs that you need to kind of find a way to differentiate yourself. Uh, that being said, I know it's a little past 1.30. For those of you who have to leave, don't think it's rude that you do or you have to leave. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, for those who just want to stick around for some general discussion, please, please do so. Um, and at this point, maybe we can just unmute some mics if there's some, some people who want to ask some general questions. Um, but uh, for those who are leaving, thank you for joining us. Just one last thing for if you are leaving, we have an SFU Economics LinkedIn group that's uh, almost 1,200 people strong. And I, I exclusively, Carmen and I exclusively go to um, our LinkedIn pages to, uh, to uh, talk to alumni, have people like Dylan come and, 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 and visit us and, and do these speaks. So a very, very valuable source of... Uh, of connections for you guys. Please join. Any some, we can now open it up to some general questions if anyone has any. Dylan can ask <laughs> so many questions. What is web scraping? I, I, I did not understand what that meant. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I should have defined that. So it's really mm -hmm. just taking um, an automated script. So for me, that's in Python and finding a way to pull information from websites. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you right click on any web page, there's a, a little thing at the bottom that says inspect and it'll show you all of the code that the website was written in. Right. Um, and web scraping basically just allows you to pull information out in plain text instead of it looking all fancy on, uh, on the website. Okay. Um... You had, I, I thought you did an excellent job again. I don't want to say it again, but on, on LinkedIn and how you how you do things on LinkedIn. And I do follow you on LinkedIn, uh, as you know, and I, I comment on your your posts quite a lot. Um, is this, you, do you have a strategic plan on how you, on, 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 on your sort of position on LinkedIn and, and how you voice on LinkedIn? Yeah, so I guess I'll start with the beginning. Um, it started off with me just being terrified to post until one of the people that I considered to be one of my heroes on there said, um, how much of LinkedIn's content do you consume versus do you create? And at that point I was 100% consume, 0% create. And this was someone with thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of followers. She now has her own um, academy. Um, and she was basically just saying, start posting. Like there's basically nothing to lose. I was terrified when I first started doing it. Now I post more and more to try and Kind of help other people that are around my level, um, maybe a couple of steps behind me. So what I always found most useful was finding people that were, you know, a couple of months ahead of me, maybe a year ahead of me and seeing what they were doing because they would have questions similar to what I'd have. Um, so now, I mean, I just started something called a uh, hundred days of code and it's really just trying to post more of my code one to help other people and two also to get feedback because I have a lot of people on LinkedIn that are way better at coding than I am. Um, and the more that I post, the more that I can get feedback for that. Uh, so there's that um, as well, trying to just kind of hold myself responsible for things. So I regularly post my goals and updates on those. Um, that's really a way for me to be stuck to what I commit to at the beginning of the year. I know that when I've done goals before and before 2020, I don't think I ever posted any. Um, I wouldn't really stick to them too much. Whereas 2020, I 
stuck to them regularly because every month I would have to publicly say, here's what I did and here's what I didn't do. Uh, so those are kind of the main ones for me. And then also just posting in a way that you can kind of create connection with people. Um, asking questions is a very good one. And then also just if you find anything interesting, uh, articles, books, um, podcasts, whatever else, and just sharing that because that's how I found a lot of uh, my favorite resources, books especially, just having other people's recommendations has been huge. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from Kent. Did you learn how to use SQL and Python before you graduated? And where are some good places to learn the coding languages? Yeah, so when I graduated, um, I thought that I knew R because I took one econometrics class and spent probably a total of 40 hours using R. Um, got out, tried using it again on my own, had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I don't know if I'd even heard of SQL, to be honest, before I had started work. Um, and with Excel, I thought that I was good at Excel because I could do a couple of sum functions. Um, I've learned since then that those are both a lot more complex tools. So fortunately for me, I was taught pretty much everything on the job. Um, I got very lucky and had very good mentors, but I think that those people exist out there for anyone. Um, being very upfront about what you can and can't do and what you're willing to do. So, I mean, if you, if you say, you know, I don't know SQL that well, but here's the course that I'm taking and here's the project that I'm working on and this is why I'm doing it. People are gonna be a lot more willing to take a chance on you because they see that you're willing to work and learn on your own um, and that you're willing to continue learning because it's surprising the number of people that finish school and then think, okay, that's all that I need to learn. Um, I'm gonna go out and get a job and I'll never have to learn again. And I'm sure there is some professions like that, but I've found data especially the technology is changing. Data itself is kind of weird to get used to. Um, so really just showing that you're willing to learn is the biggest thing. Um, and I guess the short answer is no, I didn't know SQL and I honestly did not know Excel that well uh, before I got my job. I actually failed both an Excel and a SQL test in two separate job interviews. Yeah, it's good to know that you made some mistakes. Uh, um, just to let everyone know as well, I mean, we're getting some thank yous and, and some people who are leaving. Um, we do have upcoming sessions as well, everyone, uh, for those who are left um, in different areas. Next week, we will have uh, uh, Runil Gounder, who's in investment banking. And the week after that, we have some called uh, Hamza Abdul Rahman, who is just graduated last year and who works for the Cleveland Federal Reserve. And uh, so we encourage everyone to at attend our events. Uh, and they're just great to listen to, I think. Um, it's nice to hear stories. Um, do we have any other questions out there for, for people? I think while well, we're waiting for a second, in case there are any others, um, attending yeah. things like this is massive. Um, I mean, you can see there's 20 or so people that joined this. Um, being those few people is gonna give you a big advantage and just joining as many of these things as you can and getting feedback from people is super helpful. Um, you're going to get so many hints that you won't get otherwise just by joining these things and spending the bit of extra time. Um, even if you're just sitting and not paying a huge amount of attention and just kind of listening out of one ear, you're going to get a lot more value than people that didn't join. Um, not just the alumni series. I mean, this is obviously fantastic. I've watched a couple of the other people through this, and there's a lot of good information there. Um, so I'd definitely go through YouTube and watch all of those if you can but just kind of anything that you find available, hearing more and more people from different industries talk, you're gonna be able to get a lot more inside information. Um, it's not even really inside, people are willing to share. You just have to spend a little bit of time trying to find it. Uh, you know, Aaron just made a good point. He just said, uh, to be honest, Zoom has made things so much more accessible. And I have to agree. I mean, these alumni series uh, or alumni sessions we've had, we've had people from all over the country. I mean, Hamza, who's gonna be uh, speaking in a couple of weeks, he's in Cleveland. We've had some uh, alumni people in Seattle and, and San Francisco working for Google and, and Microsoft, uh, respectively. Um, so it is, and you can be a participant. You're right, uh, Aaron. You can be a participant, uh, you know, actively or passively, and just listen. So I agree with you. It has made things much more accessible. Yeah, I think on that. Oh, um, oh sorry. We have a question here from. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we have a somebody who wants to use their audio. Uh, Justine, uh, can Carmen can, oh, Carmen, you can. You can no, they can unmute by themselves. Oh, okay. Justine, you want to go ahead and ask a question? Hi, yeah. So um, I was wondering how you decided between 
government jobs and the private sector because I've done all of my co-ops with the government and I like I'm very comfortable with that but I don't know if it's worth it to do the extra co-op or the extra or to jump into like the private uh, sector just for the experience or yeah I'm not sure. Definitely, yeah. I really like that, especially because um, I have two siblings, both of which went to SFU, and both of which are in public or semi-public. So one works directly for the government, the other one actually works for SFU. So I've gotten to see the kind of differences, and I think it really depends on what you want to get out of the job, um, along with what kind of flexibility you have. So with government, it's a bit, well, not a bit, it's a lot more stable. Um, you might even be able to get things like a pension You'll probably start off with better pay, um, but sometimes movement can be a bit more stagnant. Um, I'll speak specifically to the government. I know at times um, to get a promotion, you're not able to just move. You have to actually interview for the job. Um, whereas in private, there's a lot more movement. Um, there can be more flexibility in terms of roles and everything, but there can also be less stability. Um, you could be let go from a private job, especially if you're working for something like a startup. Um, and that's kind of the risk that you take, but there could also be a lot more learning um, and kind of flexing between roles. So one of the biggest things for me working for a private company is that I'm able to, I'll use the term flex up. Um, so if my manager's on vacation for a week or two, I'm able to jump in and take parts of her rollover. Um, I know with government that does happen, but there can also be a little bit more pushback, I think, just because things have to be more regulated. Um, and that just happens when you're being paid by taxpayer money. So I know when I talked to Asim actually during that exit interview, that's where the decision was made for me that I wanted to be able to kind of move around a little bit more and be able to move quickly on things. Um, so that's how I chose private um, as well. I think the other advice that I've heard multiple times is that it's easier to move from private uh, to public than the other way, just because of the pace and kind of how things are done. And, and, and I remember that exit interview quite well, uh, because it, it's, it's not something, and that's an excellent question, Justine. Um, it's, it's about um, just mobility. Um, you know, if you really, I, what I like about the private sector uh, is sometimes you have these deadlines, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen in government, because it definitely does. Um, but in the private sector, when you're working with deadlines and you're working with projects, uh, sometimes you're working these, these crazy hours. And uh, so it helps just, it helps build stamina. That's what I like about the private proud, proud sector. And I'm old, right? But you guys are really young. And so building that stamina um, really, really will help you out in, 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 in the long run. I started out in private sector and uh, it really helped me uh, just expand. Um, so I like that about it but it was a lot more pressure as well. Um, so there's, you know, gives and takes in, 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 uh, in, in both. Yeah, I think that's an important point too, is that there is a large spectrum for both. There are private companies where it is very relaxed. I mean, on one end you have things like startups where you might be working crazy hours. Um, on the other end, you might have more established companies where they're saying, you know, just a 40 hour work week or a 37 and a half hour work week. Um, it's more established and you can have the same thing, I think, with public, um, depending on projects that you're on. Like I said, I have a sibling that works for SFU and I've seen times where they've had to work longer than normal hours, but I've also seen times where they're encouraged to just put in the normal amount of time um, just because, again, it is more, it's regulated. Great, right, thank you so much. Thanks, Justine. Any other questions? I think we're getting we're getting to that time as well. Any comments? So no, I, you know, at this point, Dylan, I think we might just wrap it up. Um, I want to thank you. I mean, this was terrific. Uh, I, I mean, I learned so much. Like it's incredible. Uh, that whole first link. I mean, all of it was fantastic. But that first bit about LinkedIn is just incredibly valuable, and, and the power of LinkedIn. Um, and if you do have a chance, everyone, to see uh, Dylan and connect with him, I, I, I definitely encourage it. But also just follow his posts. I mean, they're very interesting. I think you have a nice fine line between uh, how you um, personalize things and also keep things business. You do that well. Um, I just want to let you know. So uh, it's very interesting. 
Um, otherwise, I think I think we're good um, um, for today. Uh, if there's any other questions, I, I know there was something mentioned about exit interviews. That's something that I used to do quite a lot of when when Dylan was was around. But it just got a bit too much. And the, the the format of the exit interview was simply just to derive what Dylan's you know interests were as he was graduating, get some feedback on our department, as well as you know guiding him through different uh, different connections that we had through LinkedIn and things, and just general advice. I would be happy to do that with everyone. Uh, I do that anyways. I think I've probably done it with Justine. I think I've talked to Aaron and a bunch of other a bunch of a bunch of you just off the top of my head. Uh, but I'm certainly willing to do that if you are interested. So please uh, contact me independently to do that. Otherwise, Dylan, thank you again. This was great. 